All right, folks, welcome back. We're gonna do another walk around today of the finished project. I apologize for my voice. I am the, the, the you know, wintertime cold is going around the house, but it is what it is. So today we're looking at another, it's a, it's a sort of a what if project, but it's mostly not a what if project. And I'll explain that jumbly confusing statement as we go through it. What you're looking at in front of you is a 148 scale Italeri MiG-21 MF. And you can see as it twirls around on its little lazy Susan there, it is wearing American United States Air Force markings. It's wearing the old stars and bars. And that itself is not the what if of this project because some of you are aware, some of you are not, that there have been an undisclosed number of MiG-21s that have been flown by the United States Air Force, that have worn American markings for a long time, very top secretly in the deserts of Nevada at Tonopah, under the 4477th Test and Evaluation Squadron, otherwise known as the Red Eagles, under the program named Constant Peg. However, the, the, the real what if about this project is the actual variant of the MiG-21 we're talking about, the MF. Because as far as we know, anyway, an MF was never flown by the Red Eagles. The other part is the color scheme on this model. I just really love the look of bare metal and international orange together. I'll explain why I decided to paint it like, like this in a little bit. But just a little background as we're talking about this project. Constant Peg and its sister project, Have Donut, those are the real names, was the American program to acquire, exploit, and then fly Soviet aircraft during the Cold War. And the so a lot of it is still classified. A lot of it has been brought to light, but basically, the United States Air Force acquired through whatever means um, different Soviet aircraft, took them apart, flew them, found out their capabilities, their weaknesses, uh, what they were good at, what they were not good at, a lot of what they were not good at, uh, and then developed tactics that our forces uh, could employ against them to, to best defeat them. What they also did, again, at the, in the highest secrecy, was bring in small groups of U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, and U.S. Marine Corps pilots into that desert area in the Nevada Test and Training Range, somewhere between you know, the Tonopah Test Range in the, the far northeast, sorry, northwest, and Nellis Air Force Base in the southwest, southeast. Wow, I got my compass rose totally mixed up, sorry. Um, the, the knitter is a large airspace, and they would actually uh, allow United States uh, military pilots to fly against these aircraft. And uh, two, for two reasons. Number one, to get them over what they called the buck fever, which is that uh, excitement, nervousness, and uh, anxiety of the first time you actually physically see the enemy aircraft. So they would actually meet up with these aircraft airborne, get to see it firsthand, put eyes on it, and then get to fly in formation with it and do some basic maneuvers with it and see what it could do. Then they would actually do sorties flying mock combat against these aircraft and work out that, that the you know, hunters understand buck fever, um, work that out. And so that if and when they had to face these aircraft in combat, it would not be the first time they were ever actually seeing these aircraft live in the sky and would have some experience. Now, the Air Force had experience, you know, taking apart MiGs all the way back to the Korean War when defectors or, you know, captured aircraft were brought back. Uh, Chuck Yeager, the, the man of men in the United States Air Force, actually had videos, and this is unclassified at the time, um, you know, because it was not a secret, flying a MiG-15 in American markings. So the way that the United States Air Force first got their hands on a MiG-21 was, again, top secret, and it was thanks to the Israelis. They ran a program called Operation Diamond. In 1966, the Mossad had uh, convinced an Iraqi Air Force pilot 
to defect with his brand new MiG-21 PF, which was at the time outside of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, it was the, the fanciest MiG you could get. Uh, the sum of a million dollars was was paid also, and there was some religious implications too. He was a he was an Arab Christian, feeling very persecuted by by the the, the Muslim government at the you know the whole the whole thing. And anyway, um, they convinced him to defect, and there was a very large operation that went into it. He brought the plane, landed it in Israel. Uh, the Israelis got a chance to check it out. And, and take a look at it. When they were done, they let the United States uh, take it, bring it back to, to uh, the US, which of course, they brought it to the, uh, the Air Force's uh, little secret area in the Nevada desert, which is officially known as Groom Lake Test Facility. It has some other unofficial names. And they began to go to work seeing what it could do. And that was the beginning of the Have Donut program and what would later become Constant Peg. So there's some historical perspective. Uh, and there are, there are pictures of the, that MiG-21 PF that have, of course, since then been released, you know, flying with the, the same markings you see on this aircraft, just a simple number on the tail, stars and bars, nothing else, um, as the United States Air Force started to do its exploitation of the capabilities of the MiG-21. Um, just in time, to help equip our pilots with knowledge to uh, defeat it in, in Vietnam. So what I decided to do here was do the what if of a more advanced version of the MiG-21 because I really like the shape of the MiG-21. I actually really think it's a very sleek looking aircraft. Uh, I, I love bare metal aircraft and I really like the shape of the the larger extended hump in more advanced versions. Um, and what's what's in the hump in more advanced versions is extra fuel and avionics. And the MiG-21MF has uh, upgrades in fuel capacity, in radar capability, and upgraded engines. And that upgraded radar capability and upgraded engine, more power, it means that it can carry uh, a, wide, a better array of weapons, we'll say. Sorry, like I said, I'm feeling a little, a little under the weather. Also, you'll notice that uh, more advanced versions of the MiG-21 also have the horizontally opening canopy rather than the one that hinges forward. But anyway, did the United States ever have a MiG-21 MF? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, not during the constant peg program anyway. I'm not saying they, they never had one. I just really like the look of this aircraft overall. I think it looks really cool. And I just decided to go ahead and, and, and do the project. And it was done, you know, long term over the course of probably a month working little bits at a time in between other things. As for the color scheme, like I said, I just love the look. If, if you look at some old uh, Air Force, um, NASA and Edwards Air Force Base aircraft, you know, it, it, they had a bunch that were bare metal and orange uh, on the control surfaces. A lot of people are going to look at this and they're going to assume it's like a target drone or something, full-scale aerial target, because, you know, the orange vertical and, and the, the, um, the tips on the wings and the stabilators, but those, you know, full-scale aerial targets are not the only aircraft that were painted like that. If you take a look um, at Edwards, at the test pilot school and the flight research center, for visibility purposes, they also paint aircraft with high visibility control surfaces. So my whole thinking on this project here was, okay, so we have the plane, you know, for whatever reason, it's ours, we got our hands on it. It's gonna be in a secret area where they're gonna fly it, where it's restricted from other people seeing it. Perhaps, just because I like the look of it anyway, we have the control surfaces painted in that same international orange color so that a chase plane can keep better visibility of it. It's entirely because I like the look of the colors. But there is a way, I always like to do my what ifs with a plausible reality behind it. So there is a plausible reality that while testing, 
they they want to make sure it is abs is as observable as possible by a chase plane that is keeping tabs on where it is what it's doing what's going on also possibly observable uh, at low altitude from the ground um, so it, it works uh, and it is not a drone so the Italeri kit is some of their mig 21s these days are reboxed edward kits this is not but it's a pretty decent kit itself um, it could be better but it's not bad it has some pretty nice engraved panel lines the build goes goes pretty well the fit is overall pretty good little little gaps to fill in the wings which i use green stuff world uv putty which i had just discovered is a thing which makes it really easy because it's pretty much instant and since it's a putty you can you can put it on you can use just regular rubbing alcohol to clean off where you don't want it hit it with uv light done uh, and it's nearly perfect so construction was was pretty good the instructions for putting it together could be more clear uh, it's not the not the best illustrations um, but it gets the job done the way that italeri puts the kit together um, they have uh, pretty much a basic mig-21 fuselage and wings and then you can tell that they made it so that they could then just throw in different sprues with different pieces to make different versions of the MiG-21, which is which is fine. Most companies do it that way, um, but it uh, it means that there's there's some little details that that might be amiss here and there, just small little details between different versions. So, you know, the Edward kits, of course, are going to be more accurate. They have some of the best MiG-21s available, but in general, the shape is is fine the the dimensions are fine um, the cockpit is a little bit lacking in in some aspects it does not have any kind of uh, controls switches circuit breakers or anything on the side walls um, and once again it just has one one um, instrument panel for no matter what version of the mid 21 you're building eh. It's a you know it's also a much cheaper kit than the Edward kits, so you kind of get what you pay for. But it, like I said, for this project, it works, and I'll do some close-ups of the of the cockpit in a little bit. There's a good amount of nose weight up forward to keep the nose on the ground, which you also have to do with most Mig 21 kits. All of the metallics on here are clad to metallics of different kinds uh, the base color is polished aluminum there's high shine aluminum there's airframe aluminum there's a little bit of chrome um, there's uh, steel uh, stainless steel uh, there's all kinds of different metallic colors that go into this to give it the look of different kinds of metal surfaces different kinds of conditions all the decals are from are from spares so the numbers here that's from a, an old p51 kit um, I couldn't I don't remember where the and that's all there is there's the tail number and the stars and bars and I don't think that uh, anything on this plane is actually a 148 scale decal I think I just took them from wherever I had them to match kind of the size from photographs I saw and those are the only markings that are on MiG 21s. A lot of the MiG 21s that that were evaluated um, from Operation Diamond only wore stars and bars, and that's it. The actual MiG 21s that were flown in Constant Peg wore their foreign nation markings to make them as realistic as possible. And you can look those pictures up. I actually got to meet. This is a side note, just name dropping here. Uh, Gail Peck who was uh, an, an Air Force officer. He was Lieutenant Colonel Gail Peck at the time. Um, and yeah, that is his real name, Gail Peck. Um, but he was one of the officers mostly responsible for Constant Peg and making it happen. Uh, when I was a, a student at, at Air Force Weapons School, um, he was long since retired, but he taught my classes AMRAM, uh, AIM-120 AMRAM academic block. Why he taught that block of instruction, I have no idea. but he is a genius he taught some of the most complicated 
technical, you know, how that missile functions and its logic circuits, like like Mr. Wizard on TV, if you're old enough to know Mr. Wizard, made it so easy to understand. And I really wish I could have gotten a picture with him, but of course we were in a facility where no electronics were, were allowed. Uh, but it was really a, a like a like an honor and a and a real pleasure to interact with a guy who I don't know if you're not an Air Force geek, never mind. But it was it was really awesome. So inside the cockpit, there's a all hand brushed up front instrument panel, which came out okay. You know, there's not a lot going on in there, honestly. Um, so I just did my best. On the sides, because like I said, there was nothing there, I used spare decals from an Edward MiG-21 to actually um, fill out the cockpit and give it a little bit more detail there. So what's on the in the cockpit sidewalls, there's nothing there for the kit. So for those, I used some resources I had. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see on this side, probably not because the canopy. Um, in the cockpit tub, those details come there and those are painted on. But for the sidewall uh, circuit breakers and switches and stuff, those are decals from an Edward set because it came with it came with two sets of decals. So I just used it, and that was uh, pretty cool. For panel lining, um, so you know, on a on a metal finish like this, if you just use black, which is what we're usually tempted to do, it's gonna look it's gonna look like a toy. So what I used was a uh, Vallejo acrylic. I don't have it in front of me. It's uh, either a, a, it's either dark brown or, or deep brown or something like that because it will fill out the panel lines really nicely, but it won't just make them look pronounced and, and black you know lines like like a, like a printed toy. What it also did was it kind of helps give the idea, that maybe those panel lines are dirty, not just something I filled in to enhance panel lines. This thing would be flying in the desert at Nellis in the Nevada Test and Training Range. And so the brown panel lining really kind of lends to that the plane is dirty rather than just I used a panel liner to uh, demarcate panel lines, you know what I mean? So that was pretty good. And I actually really enjoyed using that Vallejo acrylic panel liner. It was the first time I, I really used it and it really kind of aided in and, and, and added to the overall look. My gloss coats on this prior to uh, decaling and weathering were Tamiya X22, which I use all the time. The final coat, that I wanted to try something a little bit different was this Mr. Color right here, which I should have been fine, should have done nothing. I don't know what happened because after I used it, I got these kind of crazed areas. Now they are super smooth to the touch. It's not like it, you got another area right there and another area right there. It, it didn't bubble the paint. It didn't raise it up. You can't feel it, but I don't know why that did what it did. It, it really was very disappointing. And I went on some model groups on Facebook to ask opinions of some guys that maybe have more experience and are smarter than me. And they all just said, you know, the hell with it, leave it. Um, I don't know I don't know how this interacted. I, this is supposedly a, an, an acrylic lacquer. I thought maybe it was an enamel that ate through I don't know what happened there. You really can't see it sitting on the ground. So I said, the hell with it. I'm, I'm just going to leave it because to actually work on it and, and try to try to do anything at that point might actually do more harm than good. The weapons loadout, very standard for a MiG-21. Two AA-2s, one in infrared, one in semi-active radar guidance, and, and then two rocket pods. MiG-21s carried uh, rocket pods all the time in frontal aviation for you know standard ground attack and close air support. And I figured if American pilots were going to fly this plane and test out its systems, you know what might they carry? 
Now, in reality, during the uh, the programs, these planes were flown without weapons. Weapons were not tested. It was just the general flight characteristics of the plane. But I wanted to throw some weapons on there because, I don't know, combat aircraft without weapons, that's just anarchy. The orange areas are um, Model Master Acrylic International Orange, because I still have some of that, and it's such a beautiful color. The dielectric panels, the green, that is Model Master Enamel Medium Green. Same medium green that would be used with uh, Southeast Asian or uh, European One camouflage. And I wanted to do a flat. I was going to use my standard Windsor & Newton to give them a flat sheen as opposed to the gloss. But I discovered Green Stuff World Max Matte. And there's some dust on there. I just noticed sticking to it. I gotta clean that off. Um, some Max Matte. So I decided to try that out. And I gotta tell you, Max Matte is probably my new favorite matte coat, flat coat. It sprays perfect, non diluted from an airbrush. You can brush it on. It cleans up easy. It is, I so recommend you get your hands on some. It is absolutely amazing. So, uh, anyway. This is my uh, like latest working on in between other projects project. I just figured I would show it to you guys. It's another one where like I don't show the build as I'm going on because I'm just not sure if I'm even, you know, it's one of those where I don't know if it's even ever gonna get finished one day. But when I show you these walk arounds, I just really am genuinely curious what everybody out there might think about it. And if you have any constructive criticisms, you know, and that includes, I hate it. What a terrible idea. Why would you even build such a thing? What were you thinking? Um, so let me know. What do you think of this idea? The build, the kit, the general idea of the what if. I welcome all of your thoughts. Just figured I'd show it to you now that it's finally done after about a month. For all of you guys out there in YouTube land building your own, keep building them, build them well, and I will be back with another full project real soon.